Coming up, we discuss enhancements coming to Epcot, Universal reveals more info about their upcoming roller coaster, we honor a lost Disney World attraction, and in the main segment, we have our interview with YouTube personality and Disney fan, Roxy Dar. All that and more on this episode of WDW Opinion. Cue the music. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. This is the podcast where two friends, Connor. You are a child plaything. And Hank. You are a sad, strange little man. And you have my pity. Share their opinions, tips, and stories about anything and everything at Walt Disney World. Trust me. What are you going on? Get ready, because this is WDW Opinion. We're in the tower. We are ready for takeoff. Hello and welcome to episode number 32 of WDW Opinion, the podcast where friends talk Disney. We share our Disney World opinions so that you can start planning for and daydreaming about your next perfect Disney vacation. We share our opinions with our blog, podcast, Facebook live streams, and more. Join the Disney Opinion conversation by following us on social media where we are at WDW Opinion and visit WDWOpinion.com to check out our blog posts on all things Disney and to see what we're up to in between episodes. There you can also get a free Disney trip planning checklist when you sign up for our weekly email newsletter. I'm your host, Connor Brown, and I'm joined by my co-host and Disney partner in crime, Mr. Hank Molsky. Hank, a new apparel and tchotchke line called Delish brings iconic Disney Parks food into merchandise form. They have some very interesting products, but the one that has me scratching my head the most is the turkey leg body pillow. Do you actually see a need for this? Um, Not sure how I feel about that, because I usually like to be the little spoon. (laughs) Poop, there it is. I, it, it was really hard to bite that joke, uh, to deliver the joke, because I really to wanted to make bite? funny. Why'd you have to say bite there, though? I don't know. I was, uh, yeah, I was going to deliver that joke because I really wanted to make fun of the fact that it only took three takes for Connor to say his name <laughs> on <laughs> this episode. That's true. You'll never hear those takes, though. <laughs> you'll, hear the, you'll only hear his joke. No, this is true. Um, I talked about this uh, on the live stream on Facebook. We do every Tuesday night at 7 p.m., uh, facebook.com slash WDW opinion every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. So Disney Delish merchandise celebrates the fun of Disney Parks food. This is coming from the Disney Parks blog. Uh, there was a pop-up, but basically it's inspired by the popular retail trend of turning food into merchandise. Hank, did you know that that was a popular retail trend, turning food into merchandise? Uh, no. Yeah, that's the first I'm hearing of it as well. They dive into this whole thing about how their creative group got together with their research group and blah, 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 blah. Suffice to say is there's a bunch of products that look like food that you can buy buy that aren't actually edible. Okay. But ha- have you seen any of these? No, I haven't seen any of them at all. All right. Some of them are kind of kind of cool. I mean, I think it's very... The reason you're buying these things is so that you can take your photo and post on Instagram, without a doubt. So they have something like Minnie Mouse, uh, Minnie Mouse ears, you know, but the ears are two strawberry frosted donuts, <laughs> yeah. which yep. is like yep. strawberry frosted donuts aren't necessarily a Disney food thing. Like they have Dole Whip, um, pillows, which I think is, is fun because they also smell like pineapple. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, they have a couple other things. But what I really like is the way they package a lot of this stuff. So there's Lots of the there's pizza socks, which, again, like pizza isn't... Everyone's seen that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone's seen that before. But they, um, I, I was almost going to say serve it to you. No, they sell it to you in a box that's shaped like an actual piece of pizza. So I was saying because of this packaging, it seems very like like a Funko Pop vinyl. So it's an interesting product. It's a fun product, but people might keep a lot of these things in the package, might not actually use it for what it's intended. Great, more of that stuff. Exactly, but I mean, it's just one of those, you know, Disney things that's kind of like when they got on that fidget spinner trend. You know, got to get those fidget spinners out. So 
God, get him in the park. Just another Disney trend, like the millennial they ever pink. Make fidget spinner mouse ears. No, but I mean, if you're looking to go in on a side business, I'm I'm all for that. I don't know how we're going to manufacture it, but okay, let's 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 get ahead of the trend. You and me, we're going to the top. We're going all the way to the top. But before we get to the top, we got to get to news to opinion. This is our weekly segment where we each pick a recent Disney news story to discuss and share our thoughts and opinions on. My Disney news story of the week, it's a big one. First of its kind play pavilion and new park entrance are part of Epcot's historic transformation. So this is coming right from the Disney Parks blog. As many of you know, we've got big plans for our multi-year transformation of Epcot with new experience that'll wow guests while keeping true to the original version of the park. Today, we're excited to share even more of what's to come. The ongoing evolution of Epcot includes plans for a play pavilion that'll be unlike anything you've ever seen at the park. This new space will be devoted to playful fun and feature an innovative city that'll come to life under the dome of the unnamed pavilion, previously known as Wonders of Life. The Pavilion City will be bustling with interactive experiences, your favorite Disney characters, hands-on activities, and engaging entertainment when it opens just in time for the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World. There will also be exciting changes to the way you come and go at Epcot. As you can see in the artist rendering, and you can check out the artist rendering by going to wdwopinion.com slash episode 32. That's where you'll find the show notes page, and we link out to this article where they have the artist rendering. Changes are coming to the Epcot main entrance, where the plaza will welcome guests with new pathways, sweeping green spaces, and a newly reimagined fountain. This new design will pay homage to the original park entrance with fresh takes on classic elements. As part of the new experience, Leave a Legacy Photos will be moving into a beautiful setting just outside the park's gateway. Additional significant redevelopment will begin between Spaceship Earth Attraction and the World Showcase Promenade, but more details to come on that transformation at a later date. If you're excited about these upcoming projects, you'll soon be able to look into the future with us at a new Experience Center coming to Epcot later this year. The Experience Center will be located Not in a the, good sign. No, the Experience Center will be located in the Odyssey <laughs> Events Pavilion. Not a good sign. Please come look at our artist renderings. This way, this time they won't be we apologize. static. <laughs> They'll be moving. You won't see anything else, but that was always the big thing that they did at Coronado Springs with the tower. Like they yeah. ran a video there for months and then they were like, we have some exciting new footage of the tower that's being constructed. And it was just the video that they had been playing for six months in the actual <laughs> resort. Anyways, there are a couple things I think are interesting about this, Hank. One, the thing I'm least interested about is actually the play pavilion itself. Um, yeah. The artist rendering looks cool. That's true. It looks a lot like, you know, yeah, I don't trust that rendering as far as I can throw it. No, I mean, people are comparing it to Ralph Breaks the Internet as they should. It looks ex- a lot like that. We'll yeah. s- we'll see what it actually turns hey, out to be. it looks good, man. One interesting take I heard on this was think of Epcot, a future world at Epcot. Think of how it's divided right and left. If you go to the right side, what are you going to get? You're going to get the seas with Nemo and friends. You're going to get Soren. You're going to get Figment. You're going to get Living with the Land. All but one attraction, Soren, does not have a height restriction, yet Soren is still an incredibly family-friendly ride to go on. If you think about the left side of Future World at Epcot, what are you going to have? You're going to have a Guardians of the Galaxy roller coaster. There's going to be a height restriction there. You have Mission Space, and you have Test Track. It's very, you know, adult-friendly, older kid-friendly they needed this over there to kind of balance it out, which which makes sense. It's going yep. to appeal to the kids. You know, parents can go in there while the older kids or the older adults can go ride rides that they are actually tall enough to ride. Yeah. But, I mean, there's just so much that we don't know that I don't think we can formulate a solid opinion on. I agree. that uh, the, the rendering looks beautiful, but it really is. And you and I have said this before. It's It's a rendering. And it's just, I don't know. 
anytime I see like a dark rendering like that, I think of like gross carpets and dark spaces and like, you know, fluorescent lights that looks way dirtier in person. But we'll see. You never know. And there's a lot of things people are, you know, playing into or overhyping. There's a sign in the back that says Wedway. Did you catch that, Hank? Yeah. So like the Wedway people mover, but who knows if there's actually going to be anything like that related. Right. It could just be like, I mean, the equivalent of like one of those toy train sets that runs around your favorite restaurant at home. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah very true. That That's a good point. I think one of the big things is that the Leave a Legacy photos will be moving into a beautiful setting just outside the park's Dude, gate. That, that, that sentence in the, yeah, that sentence is just like, you know what, Disney? I understand that you guys have a lot of, you know, Disney fans to appease out there, but like, can't you just move them out there without having to say they, they're going to a beautiful new home out on the pasture? Yeah, it's like they wrote that thing like, oh, guys, stop. We got we to gotta put a sentence in there because everyone's going to be mad because we didn't say sorry about where we're moving them. Yeah. Yeah. Our dog bit someone, so he's going out to pasture. Oh, that's yeah. all right. Oh, it's you mean you're though. killing it? Yes. Yeah, Read absolutely. Read that sentence again. Beautiful. Leave a legacy photos <laughs> will be moving into a beautiful setting just outside the park's <laughs> gateway. <laughs> It really is like that. Fido's fine, guys. <laughs> He's fine. He's fine. New York's great. He's going to love yeah. it. This has always been an eyesore. It's always been hard to get through. I mean, what we've heard for so long is once you get off the monorail, once you get off the buses, once you get off the tram from the parking lot, security there is a nightmare. It's just a bottleneck. It builds up. It's out of control. And yeah. it opens up into a gigantic space, which security should be so much f- further back. And I think that's what they're going to try to do with this. They're going to get yeah. those stones out of the way. They're going to probably move security over, I would assume. But I think it's going to be a better entrance just in general. It's going to be more Epcot-like. It's going to seem like it's flower and garden year-round. It's going to Mm -hmm. be picturesque and beautiful. Um, I don't know as much as they keep saying it's going to harken back to the, you know, days when Epcot first opened. I think that remains to be seen. Who really knows? And and what are they trying to accomplish with that? You know, it's been, you know, 40 years. Another thing I observed is it's, and think about it this too, Connor, is it pushes right now no one wants to take a photo in front of Spaceship Earth with the blocks. Everyone goes right to the middle. You know, now if you expand that angle and at least you have like a few more side areas yeah. where you can get a perfectly decent photo with some flowers behind you, it's not everyone that comes in the park has to go right to the center right now. Yeah. Be- you know, no. Yeah, you can't go anywhere else. No, that you backs your up photo. things even more. When as soon as you get through the turnstiles, there's a photo pass person there, and there's a gigantic line, so you have to walk around that and things. Oh, it's a mess. And then think about this, Connor. You're also like just going up the side of that middle, whatever you want to call yeah, it, no. garden. And people are taking these photos on the side. So the sidewalks are blocked. Yeah, it, it's good for traffic flow for sure. It's good. It looks great in the renderings. I think. You know, we say this all the time about the renderings. It's going to change, but I think this is the right direction. So as long as they stay on that same path, that'll be cool. We can kind of see in the renderings that it looks like there's topiaries there, like that are, you know, present at Flower and Garden. So that's very cool. You know, the only other line here that I think is worth bringing up is the fact that additional significant redevelopment will begin between Spaceship Earth attraction and the World Showcase promenade so i think that's even bigger because if you think this artist rendering looks like very different from what the epcot that you know and love today i think what's going to happen on the other side of spaceship earth is going to be even bigger i mean i think buildings are going to go down i think something's going to happen with the fountain i think it's going to look drastically different there's going to be a lot of construction going on at epcot probably when it ends at hollywood studios as well all right, Hank. Well, that's mine. We got the new play pavilion and a new park entrance coming to Epcot. What is your news story of the week? Okay, so we're going to go back in time 15 minutes before the news story that you dropped. Whoa. Uh, somewhat, yeah, 15 whole minutes. Uh, right before Disney decided to drop their stinker on the parade that um, Universal Studios was rolling out, and that was... I'm reading this article from The Paste. Universal has announced a new roller coaster for the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. While 
everyone that's an enthusiast and gets on Disney Twitter or gets on Orlando Twitter has seen track being laid for a long time. There's been hints in the past of a red track flying through uh, the Enchanted Forest. Uh, people have known about, you know, rumors of a ro- roller coaster replacing uh, Dueling Dragons. Uh, so it was always going to be a roller yeah. coaster. I think what yes. we yeah, yeah. They had said, you know, a new roller coaster is going to be replacing Dueling Dragons in Hogsmeade. In the family w- coaster too is what they said. Yeah, right? I don't even know if they said family coaster to begin with, but I don't know if they ever alluded to thrill or anything like that. But once they pulled back the ribbon fine or cut the ribbon, once fine, Dueling yeah. Dragons went away from Hogsmeade and the Wizarding World of Islands of Adventure at Universal Orlando, they announced you know another. Uh, Roller coaster was going to come, but we didn't know the details around it. And now we have the car. The track that's been empty is now they put a, they've essentially put a, a car on the track in the in the artist rendering, right? And it's Hagrid's motorbike coaster. Please, so last, please say the full name. Uh, is there a colon? Oh my god, no! There should be. It's a Hagrid's colon. Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. No colon. Take that, Disney. <laughs> Last, so I'll just read the opening paragraph. Last week, Universal announced the latest addition to the Universal Orlando Resort, and fans of a certain groundskeeper should get excited. Visitors to the Hogsmeade portion of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Islands of Adventure will be able to strap themselves into Hagrid's motorcycle and take off on a thrilling new adventure. Uh, with the June 13th opening of Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. Universal promises that the theme coaster will let guests see, quote, some of the Wizarding World's rarest magical creatures. Uh, blah, 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 blah. It's being uh, crafted by Intamin, a Swiss amusement company. Intamin, yeah. Intamin. Um, bah, 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 bah. I, I, I did want to just skip forward to this one sentence that I found interesting in this particular article, Connor, that I wanted to talk about. And it was... It's a couple... Uh, Gringotts and Forbidden Journey are both world-class attractions that raised the bar for themed entertainment. Paste Magazine doesn't expect Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure to shoot for that level of immersion. But given Universal's excellent track record with Harry Potter, it should still be an amazing experience. So I thought that was kind of interesting that they were tempering expectations on this type of thing. Where do you currently rest on this um, this attraction, Connor? I mean, I think it is going to be incredible. I think, well, I don't, I won't say incredible. I think it's going to be cool. I think Universal was kind of they got jobbed because. This whole track layout was released way before. We didn't know the name oh, yeah, of it. Baby. We didn't know. Connor and I know every turn of this thing because you can go out and just, if you really want, Connor and I aren't going to do this right now to you. You can go out and listen to a turn by turn show of the entire thing. Yeah. And when that happened, when that footage came out, uh, it was a YouTube clip of, you know, just uh, a theme park commenter uh, brought it out. Universal was pissed. People got fired, actually, because that, yeah, yeah. you know, info was leaked so well. So this this is out there. I don't know if it's Universal kind to manage expectations of people because of that video that they've seen, because of that news that has gotten out. I will say this much. Intamin, the people that are building that roller coaster, they build some you know, badass thrill rides, like some yeah. crazy, crazy thrill rides. Right now they have the fastest um, LSM launched roller coaster in the world, which is at uh, Ferrari Land, okay? So it's a roller coaster theme to Ferrari. They have a bunch of other ones, but the one you probably know the most, Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts. So just, you know, um, right next door at Universal Studios, Florida. So what you're doing is you're combining a world-class roller coaster creator with Universal Creative with Harry Potter. I think it's a recipe for success, and I think it's going to be cool. I also think what this signifies is, you know, the battle with Disney and Universal isn't over. There's a reason when Universal announced this, and they announced, oh, it's going to be a Hagrid ride. I mean, you know, outside of Ron, Harry... Hermione and Dumbledore, Hagrid's got to be the most popular character, right? 
people sure. people love Hagrid. Voldemort. Voldemort. Sure. But I think it's just it's a very, very likable character. Yeah. When they announce this and Disney, you know, fifteen minutes after announces Epcot, our second park in Disney World, is going to be getting a new entrance and a new pavilion. Yeah. That's just saying like you know, screw you, Universal. We're gonna one up you on your your yeah, day. That's we've had this thing. We've had this thing saved as draft for a long, long time. Push send. It happened. Push send. send. Yeah, I mean, think. Of, I love thinking about that, Connor. I love thinking about how how massive a corporation of Disney. You know, so obviously, uh, yes, we can. It's easy to visualize that thing's been saved as draft for a long time, but it's a, It's still amazing to me that. As a corporate, a, a corporation as large as Disney was able, as quickly as they were, to just go, yes, it was time. Someone hit send. Twenty minutes. How petty like, they can be for such a it's large so, corporation. Yes, it's so petty, man. It's crazy. I mean, like even you, th- you and I work for small or companies, and it's like, dude, if someone went to the bathroom or went and took a phone call, we couldn't hit send. Twenty minutes <laughs> on something that we're doing. Be like, ah, I gotta wait for Eric to get back from the bathroom. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. it is very, very interesting. And it's funny. It's because they know exactly when these things are gonna happen. It's like they have, you know, spies in, in each other's departments and things like that. Yeah. Um, nice. but I think, you know, in summation, these two announcements were made, you know, 15 minutes apart from each other, but I think, Neither one of them should take away from each other. They're both no, very, yeah. very cool. Very excited. Very excited for. Obviously, I'm more excited to go to the on the motorbike attraction than the other attractions that were announced at Disney. Oh, absolutely, and that's going to be coming on this year, right? In the fall, I think. Is that what they said? No, the summer. June. Yeah, June. June. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be cool to be seen. Same week as Galaxy's Edge in California. There you go. It's going to be cool to be seeing some cool stuff coming you know, this summer to Universal uh, in yeah. Florida. And, you know, if they still say family-friendly, I think that's important because Universal still needs family-friendly uh, rides. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so there you go. New entrance and a new pavilion coming at Epcot. And we finally get a name and theme for the new roller coaster coming to Hogsmeade. <laughs> Now it's time for In Memoriam. Longtime head of Imagineering, Marty Scalar, would often say Disneyland is not a museum. What he meant by that is sometimes you have to say goodbye to one attraction in order to say hello to a new one. Times change, technologies advance, and Imagineering will always be looking to create new and exciting attractions for fans to enjoy. Sometimes the location of an old attraction is the perfect place for a new one. This is the segment where we honor the attractions of the past and remember them fondly. Today's attraction we are holding this service for is the Magic Kingdom Skyway. Hank, you picked this attraction. Why'd you pick it? And uh, why don't you go ahead and take the lead on this in memoriam service? (laughs) Connor, is there a better time to jump back in and memorialize the the skyway than when the newest skyway is about to open up at Walt Disney World nah, with a new name? I don't think so. I, the time yeah. is now. The time is now. Um, the skyway, Connor, it's been, it, it's been shut down since 1999. Spoiler alert for this segment. Um, so it's been, it's been down for nearly two decades, but, um, Definitely was kind of a, an iconic piece of both um, Magic Kingdom and Disneyland. Uh, closed in 94 in Disneyland, five years before uh, the Magic Kingdom. But it offered a bird's eye view of the Fantasyland and Tomorrowland areas of Magic Kingdom. For those of you that are, who knows, born after the time of the Skyway in that part of the park, is this left from kind of the corridor because Fantasyland's undergone a major transformation since the time that this ride um, shut down. Kind of in the corner, that corridor back over by It's a Small World and Peter Pan's Flight um, took off in that area and slowly took, um, it was a low capacity ride, 
<laughs> took people from that area of the park over towards Tomorrowland. So where the entrance in Fantasyland of the Skyway was is actually now the Rapunzel bathroom. Of course. Yeah. Iconic. Iconic. Um, not a high capacity ride. Two or three people fit in a gondola. It was a stationary um, overhead rail that these uh, systems move through in the park. Uh, a cast member would open the door, lock you in, and you'd be on your way. Uh, they could hold up to four adults, actually. I was wrong. Um, and then you would face each other on this, like, so think about four people as, you know, pretty much the same size as a uh, people mover uh, cart take you through, and you'd get this kind of picturesque view of that part of the park. Um, you'd move through Fantasyland on your left would have been, um, and this is, there's two stations, I should note also, so you could go from Tomorrowland or Fantasyland. So we're going to travel the Fantasyland route. On your left, you'd have um, Small World, right, Peter Pan. Fly over the uh, the merry-go-round to your right. And Connor, on your left, 20,000 leagues under the sea for um, a good amount of time when this thing was up and running. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that lagoon remained for, for a very long time, even after under the... Yeah. Or, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea closed in 1994. It became Ariel's Grotto. It became other places. So that lagoon was always there for a while. So I think what this is, is just a cool view. I think there's a lot of, you know, backstage stuff that you would see, but you have to also think about when this ride was there. It was there in the fantasy land heyday of being old, old school English. Like yes. old school European, I should say. It felt very Swiss. Yes, exactly. Especially with the decoration. So the the station that it left from in the Fantasyland corner, uh, a lot of stone and woodwork mixed in together, kind of that Scandinavian style, uh, very similar to the feel of like the Nor the Norway Pavilion at Epcot. Uh, if you look at it out front and. The, these gondolas would depart from out front and kind of just, you know, shoot up in the air. And it was a beautiful, um, you know, uh, yeah. uh, load area, too. I mean, there was the ponds there and stuff. It it was very pretty, and it fit in perfectly. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of – it does make you um, miss that corner of the park. I mean, they did a good job with, you know, Rapunzel oh, yeah. or Tangled stuff in that corner of the park. It's very, very pretty, but um, not, not much function Mm-mm. now. Um, so yeah, you'd go, th- you'd fly over, uh, Fantasyland past, the uh, the teacups, kind of take a turn and then descend down towards the terminus in Tomorrowland, uh, back over there, kind of near, um, not far off from where the, um, the Tron coaster's going in now yeah, in right. that corner of the park. Yeah. L- land in that corner back over by Space Mountain. So one of the interesting things about this was as you're coming into Tomorrowland, you go over the speedway. And you actually go almost all the way down to touch the ground. You wave to a cast member, and then it takes almost a 90-degree turn, and you go back up into Tomorrowland. So it has to take kind of this L turn. It can't so go goofy. straight through. Yeah. I'm not- it's like a station, too. Man, I barely remember riding this thing because I rode it a few times as a small child. Same, yeah. And I feel like it's got to be for security purposes, right? Like if something goes wrong, that that's almost the halfway that's what point. I always understood. Yeah, so they they but can get they people. Did they run at certain times? Did they shorten it where people were getting off over in Tomorrowland? Or did that never happen? I don't know if that ever happened, but I don't. Yeah, here we are just making up theories now. Obviously, at this at this great attractions memorial service, we're just bad mouthing its name. <laughs> it was no, a very yeah. interesting attraction just because so we're kind of taking this from this blog uh, called yesterland Mm -hmm. and we'll link to it in the show notes as well um wdwopinion.com slash episode 32 there's this great quote that basically says you know you don't need a full story to have a great attraction you know, this is just pure yeah. sightseeing entertainment. And it knew what it was. That's a good point. It is sightseeing. And, and I feel like you and I are kind of just sitting here observing it. But that's kind of what the attraction was meant to do. You were just an observer. Yeah. There's no theme. There's no controversy. 
it just kind of floated through the sky. Now, let's go ahead and look forward to the future. Um, it not being replaced. It spent 20 years Disney World without a gondola system. And I'll, but, uh, and I'll say... Gondolas are returning. I'll yeah. say this much. the when, it's, when it announced it was being closed, the Walt Disney World spokesman, Diane Leader, said, It's part of our ongoing efforts to phase out some of the older attractions and introduce new things to keep our parks exciting for our new and repeat guests. It's just something whose time has come. If that statement was said today about an attraction going, people's heads would explode. Yeah, it's part of our kidding. ongoing efforts to phase out some of the older attractions. A fun, fun fact. Even though they closed that in 99... A new attraction didn't open in Magic Kingdom until 2001, the Magic Carpets of Aladdin. Ugh, yucky. Yucky. So, and then now, yes, the transition is to a functional Skyliner uh, coming to Disney World later this year with one that's actually going to take you to different stations where you get off and do a different thing there. And they move pretty quick, too. Bigger, better. You know, more futuristic. An actual transportation system versus an attraction. Any other thoughts, Connor? I feel uh, I feel underwhelmed, but I think that's what this ride is kind of. That's the, the the feel of the attraction itself. And I, you know, I think what's interesting is it's one of those things that I don't think a whole lot of people are saying. Oh, I would love for it to come back. I would love for it to. <laughs> well, come it's back. back now. But. Anytime you actually press someone on it, they were like, it was pretty cool. I, I liked riding it. They're like, oh, you remember the Skyway? Yeah, the Skyway was cool. But when you press them, they're like, no, I don't need it back or anything. I will say this, Hank. You love your bottleneck in It's a Small World right around yeah. Peter Pan when you're going of into course. Liberty Square. Imagine that you bottleneck. And you can, still, you can still see the dip in the concrete. Imagine that bottleneck with a gigantic, you know, 30 foot pole going up in the air right in the middle <laughs> of it because that's where that pole was and I'll point, I'll point it out to you next time it was chaotic I'm glad you pointed this out it is fascinating Connor fascinating to look at these photos of Magic Kingdom and see so few people on a day where the park is clearly in business and open the best photo of all is the second photo on the page that's dated 1996, and right in the bottom right in the frame is a, a blonde-haired gentleman wearing sunglasses <laughs> in a uh, dark gray tank top, just baby, marble cigarette dangling yeah. from his lips. Hell, yeah. hell yeah. It is a different, oh, it is a different world for a different era. Yeah. You know, this is a, this is a memorial service. Uh, we're, we hate to see this go. We have a, something new coming that might kind of replace it, but we have to pay our respects to the fallen. Hank, I believe you've written a, a, a eulogy. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. All That's right. A, well, a you Googleizer. A you Googleizer. Um, well, could you please, uh, uh, read it, if you will? And just, this is a, this is a point, uh, from past Connor telling future Connor to add in some, you know, melodramatic, somber music right here. Okay. Go for Ooh. it. Hank. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's perfect. I That's like perfect. It. Thank you, future Connor. Okay. He's good. I like him. He knows what he's doing. Okay. Dear Sky S Skyway, oh, Skyway of Fantasyland, my memory of you is fading, but those vibrant pastel colors of your sky buggies may never do the same children of our generation barely knew thee while you didn't take guests far you did peck in quite a list of views the top of a merry-go-round the top of attractions the top of space mountain a birthday cake castle some more tops of attractions and 20,000 leagues under the sea you didn't move fast but boy you did take us to the top of it all you reminded us of simpler times. You did it in the sky. It meant of an era where families and friends, we trusted them to keep from throwing items at guests. Now we're going to lock them in a box without any open windows or air conditioning. We trusted Today you. We, we trusted <laughs> We <you>. trusted <laughs> Today we honor your original home with a beautifully themed land from a beloved Disney film, Tangled. Oh wait, that's just a bathroom. 
You took us higher than we've ever been before in Magic Kingdom, allowing our dreams to soar. But alas, sweet metal wild Icarus, we'll see you in the sky nevermore. R.I.P. Skyway. R.I.P. So I love being a part of the Disney community. Ever since I started WDW Opinion, I've gotten the ability to interact with so many incredible people. It's a community filled with passionate and caring people, and while our bond is through Disney, we've grown to appreciate each other in so many other ways. And I think I'm also so impressed with the talent that is represented in this community. Whether it's artists, designers, performers, or musicians, everyone has their own creative way of showing their Disney fanhood. Our guest today is no exception to that. She is is an accomplished performer and singer who has had the opportunity to perform at places like the D23 Expo, which is the ultimate Disney fan convention, and at the Indie Disney Meet. She has amassed a huge following on social media, and in particular on YouTube, where her covers of Disney songs have been viewed millions of times over. She has some very cool projects she is currently working on, as well as some interesting Disney stories she will be sharing with us today. We're excited to have her join the show, and with all that said, I'm very excited to welcome Roxy Dar to the podcast. Thank you so very much for joining us, Roxy. Thank you, Connor. I'm so excited to be here today. Absolutely. And thank you for, you know, I was talking to her before we started recording. Thanks for reaching out. I know you've listened to the show before, so this is very awesome. Getting our real first ever guest on WDW Opinion. Yay! (laughs) So, you know, I think to get things started, how about you just tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, how did you first initially get involved in performing and singing? Just kind of introduce yourself. Sure. Sure. Well, I've been singing since I was seven years old, lucky number seven. Uh, My mom introduced me to the world of stage by putting me up on uh, different uh, musical theater productions and, uh, you know, acting gigs where I could show my voice off and and perform for people. So I started off that way. And uh, more and more, every time I would go in for auditions for particular productions, um, I would always be asked to sing a Disney princess song. Um, so for me, it was always a part of your world because that was my, one of my favorite movies at the time. And they would always ask me to to sing these songs because they figured that my voice really resonated with this type of um, this type of uh, musical sound. Uh, is what they called it. So I grew accustomed to Disney and I became more and more in love with Disney um, as a result of how I started, which was in musicals and singing and dancing and acting. So that's awesome. So that kind of goes into my, my next question too. It's, it's how you got involved with the Disney stuff. So like you said, you know, singing part of your world was one of your first, I guess, auditions. Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. But what kind of compelled you to go down the Disney track or to stick with it when it comes to posting covers on YouTube, when it comes to posting these Disney centric videos on social media? Yeah. So what ended up happening is I was so fascinated growing up by these characters, these um, female characters that were the princesses. And I really loved the backstory of each creative movie that would come out. So I was always very interested in sort of how they grew up and how they gave back to the world through each movie. And then their songs were so beautiful as well. Um, you know, Alan, Alan Menken did a lot of those uh it, probably in the 90s, I would say, for Beauty and the Beast and, and Aladdin and um, and The Little Mermaid and such. So they all had this really nice story behind them. And I love, love telling stories through my videos. So I decided that that was sort of where I wanted to start with YouTube. I just did it for fun in the beginning because I was already doing a lot of projects um, for work, you know, a lot of musicals that, w- that I was doing and I was doing a lot of TV and film and then also working on my own album. Um, and I was touring as well. So a lot of stuff. But 
again, everyone kept saying, why don't you put up some of your, you know, Disney stuff that you love to sing that you grew up doing. So I just started doing it for fun. And then more and more it caught on. And like you said in your intro, I felt like there's like this really close knit community like Disney. I feel like Disney folks are all family. And so it really resonated with these people. And they all they all just loved this sort of um, storytelling through Disney. And then each creator had their own way of sort of putting things out there and and showing their Disney side. So mine was Disney princess empowerment, that sort of backstory on the on the princesses. And then it just kept going from there. And I and I continually love doing that. But I'm working more on my own projects now, too. So that's how I got into the YouTube world. That's awesome. And I love hearing that because I, you know, that resonates with me so much when you say, I think all of us are Disney fans are, are part of a family, which is so true because when you talk to someone who isn't a Disney fan, they're always quick to label you. Oh, he's a Disney guy. Oh, she's a Disney, you know, girl or something like that. They put us in, you know, kind of like a weird freak show kind of group, but which is totally fine because we have a huge community that we can bond with. And, you know, touching on that, uh, uh, Disney community, I know you've interacted with some other, you know, Disney YouTubers and, and people like that. How do those kind of mashups occur or is it just kind of a natural thing? Yeah, well, uh, in the beginnings, I feel like creators would reach out to each other and they would be like, hey, do you want to do a collaboration um, if it was like a similar type of channel? And then uh, they would get together and oftentimes they would be in different states, but they would do sort of like a split 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 screen type of uh, video that they would put up. Uh, but for me personally, I've done a couple different collaborations here in Los Angeles where I live. And it's just always so much fun to meet other people who are in the Disney family uh, who bring their take and their approach on videos and what they want to tell in their stories. So I think that that's that was a beautiful thing to be, to do in the beginnings. And then Sort of as we grew in the community in YouTube, uh, there was a subsidiary of uh, Walt Disney that brought me into their family and I started producing videos for them and I was chosen to go to Walt Disney World. Um, to do All Alone in Walt Disney World, which was a segment that I had written a script and a segment about, and they picked and chose my uh, idea, two ideas actually, that one and a princess empowerment one that um, that I also did in Walt Disney World that I was flown out for. So progressively it got more and more on a professional level because actual Disney folks were involved, which was awesome because obviously they have all the all the hookups um <laughs> all the opportunity to be able to go into the park and and sort of have your time there which was amazing that is awesome and i think it's one of those things where it's almost like when they reach out to you when disney reaches out to you and, and says you know acknowledges you it's like oh my gosh it's such a big moment because you know when you're a fan like that and that's all you talk about and stuff when they're actually acknowledging you, I think it, it really means the world. And for them to fly you out there like that must have just been so, so awesome. But, I mean, I think we have to talk about that video. And I just kind of want to get the backstory on it, the All in Loan in Disney World uh, video. It's on your YouTube page. And it basically, you're just completely walking, you know, alone around Magic Kingdom. Uh, and you get to interact with characters and stuff. So can, could we just hear like a little bit more of that story behind that, how that came to fruition? Sure, definitely. I sort of played off of, I think, all of our dreams. You know, I feel like as a Disney fan, we've all had that one moment where like, what if, you know, no one was in this park right now, <laughs> especially when you're waiting in those long lines. You know, that's probably the time when you're really thinking, boy, I wonder what it would be like if I was just here by myself, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh so I played up that dream sequence type thing and um, I wrote it to where, you know, I'm sleeping and I'm having this dream and I wake up at the at the foot of the magic kingdom at the castle and i walk through the castle and there's the carousel and there's this the sword in the stone and and there's uh fairy tale princess hall and i'm just like you know exploring all of the grounds that i would first go to because i i think we all have this but when we first get into the park we go to our our spots you know first yes. And that's how I enter any Disney park. I go straight to the castle and through the castle. I just feel like that's sort of where um, <laughs> that's like 
the park welcoming welcoming you to the park. So I, I like to go in through the front door um, after Main Street. Um, but yeah, so then I just sort of started walking around and dancing around and um, creating the story behind walking around and being around uh, Walt Disney World. I chatted with Snow White for a little bit. And of course, they're always supposed to be in character. So they were in character, even if there's one person there or, or, or no people there. Um, so yeah, we did Magic Kingdom and then uh, went into fa Fantasyland a little bit. I went up on Dumbo all by myself, which was a real treat. Um, and then, yeah, pretty much all over Walt Disney World, as much as I could cover. But I wanted to keep it in the realm of the dream, and so I kept the highlights of the rides and the and the big, the big time attractions, um, so that they can use it in their uh, the spot that they were creating. So yeah, it was really really fun. I mean, I think that is definitely a dream we all have, and I can say that I, I was very blessed to be there, and I'll always remember and cherish that memory. Yeah, I think. You writing that script, you know, starting as coming out of a dream is, is so perfect because that's exactly what it is. It, it is a dream, you know, and you basically had a checklist of wouldn't this be cool? Like these are the coolest things to do alone or they would be the coolest things to do alone. And just watching that video, I think you have to smile because it is a dream that everyone has as a Disney fan. And, you know, I'm a former cast member. I worked at Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, so I got to be in the park at weird hours when no guests were in there, but I never got to experience the park even like that. So it was definitely a once in a lifetime opportunity that that is on a lot of people's Disney bucket list, I think for sure. Oh yeah, that's so cool. I, I really feel like Walt Disney, you know, he, he gave us this dream. He had a dream. He worked really, really hard to get there and now he's passed it on for generations to come. And I feel like we, everyone gets a piece of that however, you know, small or big it is, whatever dream you have, you, when you're in the park, you sense that magic. It's just inevitable. I mean, despite the long line sometimes, but, but other than that, you know, you, you have this magic in the air, you go there to release your passions, to release your dreams. And so the idea behind that was really where it came in with the whole dream sequence for that particular segment. It is a total sense of belonging because even with 1000% humidity in that thick air, I feel like I can breathe so much easier in Disney <laughs> World, you know? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. I forgot you're out there. I'm I'm on the West Coast, so I have I have Disneyland, so I don't have the humidity here, but it does get hot during the summers, that's yeah, for sure. You just it's the smog that might be a problem breathing out there, right? Oh, yeah. But <laughs> Thankfully enough, when I when we shot that segment, it was in January, so it was like freezing cold. Right. Uh, yeah. So flying through on Dumbo in a tiny dress uh, was pretty cold. <laughs> the the only downside of your dreams was that that one moment. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Well, you know, I think plenty of others, you know, agree that your singing is epic, your performing is epic. So. I want to kind of hear the story of how you were invited out to D23 and even how you were invited out to the Indie Disney meet. So could you tell us a little bit of both about both of those experience and, you know, how you got involved? And then I know the Indie Disney meet does a lot of good work for, for charity. So you could comment on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so like I mentioned, the close knit community that we have uh, in this Disney uh, circles and whatnot, especially on Facebook, we have a lot of really great groups uh, that I'm a part of. And <clears throat> a lot of times I'll post certain videos that will really resonate with people and they'll really like it. And the Indie Disney Me actually reached out to me on their own. I believe they had seen some of my work both on YouTube and on Facebook. And, uh, and they were interested in having me come do a, like a princess set, like a Disney princess, uh, magical set for the kids that come to this wonderful, wonderful charity. It's, it's essentially a fundraiser and it, uh, raises funds for give kids the world, which I'm sure you know of it's, it's at Walt Disney world. Um, yes. and they give. Uh, they raise funds to give kids who are terminally ill a chance to be able to come to Walt Disney World, uh, all expense paid trip, 
uh, with their families. And it's really an experience of a lifetime. I've seen pictures and videos. Uh, I have yet to go to the actual uh, Give Kids the World Village, but spectacular. I mean, it's just so amazing to see these kids go over there and experience Walt Disney World and experience the magic and um, the power that it holds for these kids in terms of um, healing them, you know, giving them that sense of uh, relaxation and and imagination and bringing all that to life is just so precious to see. And so I thought, wow, I would love to be a part of this. I will absolutely be there. And the kids that come there are amazing too. You know, they were rocking out on stage with me. I did like, my set went past an hour. As you can see, I rant on. So I was ranting <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and the kids were up there talking to me too. So we had a blast. We sang a lot of Disney princess songs and they raised, uh, I believe close to $45,000. Uh, and it's, it was their 11th Disney meet. So they are going to have it obviously annually. And they have a lot of great performers come out, a lot of great vendors and lots of food, lots of excitement. And it was, I remember it was a very rainy day. Uh, but there were tons of people there that didn't stop anybody from coming out. And it was really a spectacular thing to be a part of. Um, I love to sing for charities. I love to sing for things that mean something that where, where money is raised to go somewhere and, and give kids, especially that uh, opportunity to experience what I experienced basically growing up. I love that. I think it's so amazing. So that was the Indie Disney Meet, and if you guys can check it out, you guys, they have a Facebook, and then also their, whatever events they do, go to Give Kids the World, which you should also check out, because again, these people are doing amazing work. Lots of effort goes in throughout the year to put this event on, but it is a success, and uh, really, if you're in Indiana, where it, where it takes place in Noblesville, definitely come check it out. Otherwise, check out the uh, sites, because I know you'll love it. Yeah, I, I've never heard a bad thing about the Indie Disney Meet. I think people are always blown away by it. And, you know, like you said, they have an incredible team of, of volunteers there. And it's just about, you know, bringing the Disney community together, even in, you know, middle America, uh, far away from both Disneyland and Disney World. But it's about that community coming together for a higher cause. And like you said, Give Kids a World is, is absolutely incredible. It's So it's located in Kissimmee, Florida. So right outside Disney World. And basically what it is, is if a child wishes for, you know, like through the Make-A-Wish organization or 500 or a thousand other wish organizations throughout the country, if they wish to go to Disney World, Give Kids the World basically helps facilitate that. So that's where they stay. There's attractions there. And you really should just consider donating because it's one of the best charities in America. I think it's something like 95% of every dollar goes to, you know, the kids vacation. So every dollar you give only five cents goes to administrative costs, which is absolutely incredible. So absolutely. yeah, it sounds like a really, really cool meet and uh, a great, incredible organization. And, I, you know, I hope to get out there one day soon, uh, hopefully as well. Yes, if you're close to it, I would love to come there too. I hope to be able to perform for them at the actual village. That would be amazing because I, I know they bring on a lot of great celebrities too to come in and, and sort of sit with the kids and perform for them, which I think is just, it's spectacular. They're amazing. Absolutely. That's that's the perfect word there, amazing. Um, you know, I've also seen that you've, you've performed at D23. So how did you get involved with, you know, the ultimate Disney fan convention as they like to deem themselves? Yes, that was so much fun. That uh, we had a great time. I was hooked up through that through the uh, company that w was working with Walt Disney. So I was hired to sing there um, on one of the main stages in the actual convention center. Uh, so there was a lot of hustle and bustle, but th definitely my voice somehow, I always say this, my voice was like going throughout this big convention center. I don't know what speaker I was hooked up to, but apparently it was just going throughout the entire convention center. Um, and I did a princess set there as well. And that was a lot of fun. There was a big, huge audience for that. And just seeing, again, that Disney spirit and that, um, I think they do it every two years. So they have that anticipation grow throughout those two years. 
And then you go and you just see all these fans, all these people. They're dressed up to the max. Uh, a lot of cosplayers are there, a lot of Disney bounders. And <clears throat> while I was singing some of my songs, uh, some of like, like I did Anna for the first time in forever. And I remember uh, there was this beautiful girl, beautiful Anna a dress that she had on. I mean, to on point. And she just jumped on stage and she was like dancing al along with me for, for the first, first time in forever while I was singing. It was so magical. And then we also had uh, Meg and Hercules. They came up too while I was singing, I Won't Say I'm in Love. And they, they sort of had this like funny thing going on like as if they were acting it out while I was singing. It was really cute and special. So people were dressed to the max. I'm telling you, they don't, uh, they don't mess around at D23. No, I know. I'm trying to get out there. This summer is D23, so I think it's at, uh, at, in August. So we'll see if we can get out there. But it just seems like, you know, the Disney fandom has turned up to 11 out there. There's just <laughs> such a, a, you know, a, a huge vibe. And, and everyone's anticipating all these big announcements and all these cool new features that they're going to be able to see. But it's just as much, you know, interacting with your fellow Disney fan as as anything else. Well, those two events sound, you know, really, really cool. And I love any event that brings Disney fans together for sure. Absolutely. And you got to plan your day too. You really got to focus on where you want to go, what time you want to see some of the panels and, and the awards that they give out and all that stuff too. So you got to schedule it out because there's much to see. And if you think, you know, planning a Disney World or Disneyland vacation is difficult, I heard that's even more impossible to get everything done that you want to in those two day period. But we'll see. We'll see if we can get it done. Um, so I think Clearly, people, you know, really love your work. You know, like I said, your videos have been viewed so, so, so many times. And I've watched just a ton of your videos. And, you know, I often get goosebumps because these covers that you do, your voice is so incredible. But I think your impersonation is also something that you do. Is that true to say that you kind of create craft the way you sing to the style of the song? Is is that something that you would say that you, you try to do? Yeah, definitely. And I think my theater background comes hand in hand with that, too. It's almost innate, like when I start to sing. And if I've seen the movie, it's sort of I feel the character. I see what position or what the director had in mind for that character. And then I, I implement that into my singing, too. Definitely. Yeah, that's very cool. That's very cool. So what would you think your favorite, uh, let's say your favorite video that you've posted to YouTube? What do you think that one's been? Oh boy, I'd have to go back and see my videos. I very rarely, it's funny, I very rarely go back and see them. Um, I definitely, okay, yeah, no, I know, I definitely know which one I like the most. Um, I, for my personal standpoint, I love Pocahontas. I love her, the story behind her. I love everything that, that she's about. So Colors of the Wind, I think that song is so magical and really, I mean, if you want to talk about bringing people together, that would be the song, you know, that's the song that, that's all inclusive, brings everyone together. And I think I, I really like the way I did that one because I did it on a green screen and we had, um, people working on that with me and it, I think we grasped the song, song's meaning with the backgrounds and the singing and, and all of that. And I, I really like that one the most, I think, um, of all the ones that I've done. But I think I'm impartial to it because of the song itself. But <laughs> yeah, no, I think I mean, I think you have to, you know, there's a reason why you pick the songs that you do. And I think you give, you know, the way you represent the songs, I think, is so spot on, and you give it a credit and and the credit that it deserves, which is very awesome. I think I also read something. Uh, did you set some sort of anthem record when it comes to the national anthem or something like that? Yes. So I've been singing the anthem since I was a very little girl, <clears throat> and uh, just been singing at the Staples Center. Dodger Stadium. Yeah, just the Dodger Stadium, just the Staples Center. You know, you might have heard of them before. <laughs> yeah, so I've done that pretty much since I was seven years old. I haven't kept track, but the amount of times I've done them, it, it, I'm positive it holds a record. Um, because I would say, at, on average, I sing the anthem for these types of games anywhere from, you know, 20 to 25, I would say 20, 25 times a year. So, um, it's been a lot. <laughs> oh my god! For me, uh, that always seems like the most nerve-wracking thing: singing the national anthem. You know, because you you can't mess it up. You can't do it. It is. 
is very nerve wracking. <laughs> Is even after all these times that I've done it, you're right because you can't mess it up. It's just some one of those things where you just can't. It actually might just be the only thing you can't because yes, <laughs> everything yeah. else you sort of have a little bit of like improvisation you can work with and you know try to brush it off like it was nothing. But here, everyone knows the words and everyone's looking at you, and most times it's sung a cappella. So I take my pitch pipe out there. I make sure I'm I, I've got my pitch going and. Uh, it's depending on, on the venue, like for instance, Dodgers stadium is more open and the lights are on you and you can see the audience <clears throat> and, um, there's an accompaniment that goes along with it. But for instance, like Staples center, all the lights just shut off in the audience. There's just one spotlight on you. I've sang for the playoffs at, at the Staples center too. So they bring the big, huge flag. Oh, yeah. So beautiful. I've also done like Canadian teams too, so I'll do the Canadian anthem first, then transition into the American anthem. <laughs> so it's like, oh my god, that is nerve wracking. Yeah, so um, it's fun though. I mean, the adrenaline and the rush and singing for my country, of course, is always an honor. So I, I very much enjoy doing that as well. Well, Roxy, they keep inviting you back, so you're probably doing something right. Yeah, let's knock on some wood and make sure I never miss any. <laughs> I got you covered. Don't worry, I got you covered. <laughs> Thanks. So what projects are you currently working on? Do you have anything to share that you've, you're have you proud you're working on or anything at all? I do. I have a very special, special project that is so close to my heart that I'm working on right now. And it's called Peter Pan's Magical World of Neverland. And it's directed and produced by James Presley, who is a wonderful director producer uh, who has been working on this project for the past, he says, six years Four, four or six years, something like that, a long time. And he had this vision of a new version of Peter Pan that can be uh, played, put up as a musical in different um, schools and whatnot for children. Now, he needed to get the licensing for this project, so he got it from um, Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, where uh, J.M. Barry donated his rights to the play, his very famous play, Peter Pan. So he put together an animation that's going to be re released on December 13th, uh, 2019 at our premiere in Las Vegas. And this animation stars Margaret Carey, the original Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell, wow. Yeah, from the 1953 animation, Disney's Peter Pan. And uh, myself. And then we also just added uh, uh, an, a couple other great, great actors, which I'm going to have to go back and look. They literally just signed on. So th they have done a lot of voiceover in, in the Disney uh, realm. So you guys will be really excited to hear that as well. And I'll be posting some of that stuff on my Facebook. But uh, all of the benefits from the animation, which will be available via digital download, and also the musical stage production that we're doing, uh, which I'm co-directing with James, uh, all the proceeds will be going to Great Ormond Street Hospital in London for the children again. And um, so I play the voice of Wendy Darling um, in the animation. And I'm telling you, this script is so amazing. He did such a great job with it. Um, it's very close to the original, but it's it has this these nuances that are just so surprising. And then we've got Margaret Carey on it, of course. So, I mean, there are a lot of surprises in store. So we are working on that. And like I said, the premiere of the project will be December 13th, 2019 uh, in Summerlin, Nevada which will be the one and only time we put this musical on for the purposes of giving the rights to uh, the Great Ormond Street uh, Children's Hospital so they can go ahead and do it uh, worldwide wherever they want to do it. That is awesome. That is a very, very cool project. Um, and there's so many different elements to it, which I yeah. find really, really fascinating. I think it's, you know, you're really going for it, which is so cool. I have a question about Peter Pan. So, you know, like you said, you, the original, obviously the play is much older than, than the animated classic, but in Disney Legend, you know, that animated classic from the 50s is still so popular today as it ever was. I mean, lines to meet Peter Pan in the park are, are incredible. There's Peter Pan mer merchandise all throughout P 
Peter Pan's flight is one of the most popular attractions still today. So what do you think it is about that story that still resonates with people today? Well, that's very interesting. It's that's the best question you can ask. I think what resonates the most with that particular uh, movie is that nobody wants to grow up. I mean, <laughs> do you want to grow up? No, I, absolutely not. not I want to go back as far back as possible. Exactly. So I feel like if you're in the Disney family and, and you're, you know, in tune with everything and all that is Disney, the very first thing you think of is this this childlike uh, feeling that you get the first time you went to Disneyland. You'll always remember that as a child. And I think that Peter Pan is very reminiscent of those times where he doesn't want to grow up and his Neverland, his island, this place where all his dreams come true and he hangs out with his friends and, and there's music and adventure is Disneyland in a way. And so in a large way, actually. So I think that people really resonate with that. And then just the element of storytelling where Wendy Darling is sitting there and telling stories to <clears throat> her brothers and the adventure that they go on. And then she goes into Neverland and she tells stories to the Lost Boys. I think that element of storytelling is um, all encompassing when it comes to Peter Pan. I think that's why they love the movie so much and they love the story of Peter Pan. Um, I personally, as Wendy Darling, have uh, written a couple songs, actually three songs, two of which have uh, I've hinted on on my Facebook and I've I actually sang one of them at the Indie Disney Meet. It's called Don't Want to Grow Up. Uh, it's an original song that I wrote for the animation. And then uh, A Shining Star as well, which I also wrote. And then a very, very special song, uh, which I will be releasing pretty soon here, um, dedicated to a Disney legend, which I'm not going to name, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty obvious. I can't wait to announce it, but uh, it is inspired by her and through her, and I can't wait to release the song. So I've done three songs for the soundtrack, and those are all going to be re released on a uh, album. May 5th is the date uh, of the release when we're going to be releasing the soundtrack for Peter Pan's Magical World of Neverland. Very cool. So, I mean, that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, I think, you know, if you follow along at WDW Opinion, Roxy, send over, you know, all the information you have, you know, when those albums are going out, when tickets are going on sale, when the premiere is, and we'll be happy, you know, spread it around our community because it sounds just like a, a very, very cool project. Sure, absolutely. And if you guys, if anyone's in town uh, near Las Vegas, um, that area, that's where we're going to have the premiere and the, uh, and the live musical adaptation for the very first time and the kids are actually going to be flying in the musical so it's going to be a pretty spectacular performance they're going to be flown by uh flying by foy which uh flew a lot of famous peter pans like uh, kathy rigby was flown by them and a couple other different uh very famous people who who played peter pan so these kids will be flying through the air during the musical and uh we will have a pre-show where i will be singing some of my songs <clears throat> from the animation margaret carey will be there it's really an exciting uh show to be a part of so i'm hoping if people purchase some of the stuff that are up on the uh, Peter Pan site, which I will, I'll send you all the information for as well. And again, all these proceeds go to the Great Ormond Street Hospital uh, for charity and for those children. Um, you get, like, for instance, I believe there's different products you can get up there. This We'll be selling the soundtrack as well, but it'll also come with a ticket for a particular price. So you kind of get one uh, one perk, and that's getting a golden boarding pass to uh, Peter Pan's Magical World of Neverland, the live musical production on that day. So if you're in town or plan on being in town, then definitely come to the show because it'll be great. Love it. Love it. Love it. We will definitely share all that info with our, our listeners as well. Okay, Roxy. So to wrap things up, I want to play a little Disney rapid fire questions. Does that sound good? Ooh, yes, absolutely. All right. I got a few of them here. All right. So favorite park. Favorite park, Disneyland. Disneyland. Now, what's your favorite attraction? Uh, Magic Kingdom. Your favorite attraction? Yeah. Well, okay. So, Peter Pan, I would say the Peter Pan ride. Peter Pan ride. Awesome. Favorite Disney food item or treat? 
Oh, the churros. Churros. <laughs> so the churros I hear are, I've never been to Disneyland. I'm hoping to change that very soon, but I hear they're 1,000 times better than they are in Disney World. So I'll definitely have to try one of those. Oh, yes, you have to. You per have to per your, your recommendation, I will try a churro. Yes. <laughs> so favorite Disney movie? Oh. These are the, tough. The Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then favorite Disney song, but say favorite Disney song to perform. Oh. Part of your world. Part of your world. <laughs> so what's one Disney song you haven't performed yet, but you would like to? You know, I'd like to do... Um, I know this sounds weird because it's like so not a princess, but I'd like to do Feed the Birds from Mary Poppins. Oh, great song. I can yeah. t- totally see that happening. Yeah, absolutely. Love that song. Yeah. So there's a ton of new stuff coming to Disneyland and Disney World. You know, this podcast is very park centric, but what is the one thing, if any, that you're most excited for to come to the parks and why? You know, I haven't been keeping up to date because I've been so busy and I haven't even gotten a chance to to uh, go to the park lately, but I will be going. I planned it, so I'm I'm definitely planning on it. So I am going to turn the question around to you so you can fill me in on something that you're excited about so I can live vicariously through you. Oh, man. Well, obviously, the big thing is Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So that's the big new land coming to Disneyland and Hollywood Studios. Um, but I'm really excited about this new ride coming to Hollywood Studios out in, you know, Florida in Disney World called Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. So uh-huh. it's, yeah, so it's taking over the old uh, great movie ride in Hollywood Studios, and it's going to be the first ever attraction, you know, starring Mickey Mouse himself. I mean, how can you go wrong with that, right? Wow, that's adorable. And it's called what again? It's called Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Ooh. Yeah, it's using some new technology. They're calling it 2.5D, so it looks like 3D, but you don't have to wear any glasses. So that's always good. Wow, that's so awesome. That is amazing. Do you guys have, um, what is it, Goofy's Flight School? Is that the one that's... It's, so, it's, our, so, okay, so it used to be called The Barnstormer in Magic Kingdom, and okay. now it's called... Um, Oh god, it's called the Barnstormer featuring the Great Goofini. So it's like it's like a kitty roller coaster, right? Yeah, yeah, I love it though. Yeah, the one yeah. that we have in California Adventure is my, like my favorite. <laughs> I don't think it's exactly the same, but it's pretty much the same thing. And I'll tell you what, I rode that recently. It's pretty intense even for for a little kid. It's a lot of fun. Yes, yes, it is a lot of fun and it's just like it have a lot of I don't know if it's the exact same one, but ours has like a lot of surprise dips and and drops and it's just like it's one of my favorites awesome hey it it doesn't matter if it's for kids adults whatever everyone's entitled to to one of their favorites you know exactly actually a lot of the kitty rides are my favorite just because they they go through a lot of the story you know like in fantasy land they go through a lot of the the main story and you just sit back and watch it and and are you know rolling along in it which i love absolutely it's perfect disney theming disney theming at its finest Exactly. exactly. Awesome. Well, those were great, great answers, Roxy. Thank you so very much for joining me today. I had a ton of fun talking with you, but now I'm going to turn it over to you so that you can let the WDW Opinion community know where they can find you and interact with you the best. Great. So you can find me on uh, Facebook, and that'll be facebook.com slash Roxy, R-O-X-Y, D as in David, A-R-R. So it'll be pretty much that way on every social media site. So Twitter slash Roxy Dar, uh, Instagram, you can look up Roxy Dar and I'm pretty active mostly on Facebook. So if you guys add me there, I put my latest stuff up right away there. And then I'd say Instagram and then Twitter. So, and then of course, YouTube, I forgot about that. (laughs) You can look up R O X Y D A R R. That's Roxy Dar on YouTube. And all my videos will be there. And please make sure to stay tuned for Peter Pan's Magical World of Neverland. I'll be putting a lot of posts up about the progression and what we're all going to be doing with regard to the soundtrack and all the latest updates on that. Absolutely. And we'll include all those, all that information 
information, all your social media channels in the show notes page. You can get that at wdwopinion.com slash episode 32. Roxy, thank you so very much again for joining me today. Thank you, Connor. I had a blast. But with you, but with you I've my place. And it's something like I've ever known before. Love is an open door. And that's going to do it for us this week. As always, thank you so very much for listening to the show. Be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And share the show with someone you think might enjoy it. If you like what you heard today, then you've been listening to the WDW Opinion Podcast. If by chance you didn't like what you heard, then you've been listening to Family Secrets. For Hank, I'm Connor. We'll see you real soon.